Um, yeah, so I thought what I'd do today is to try and talk a bit about um, how I think genetic discoveries have the potential to help us to identify new, um, new targets and, and new treatments for, um, for psychiatric conditions. I'm going to I'm going to use um, CACNO one c as we call it, um, as an illustration of this. Um, but really, I'm going to try and talk fairly, sort of at a fairly meta level about what I think we've learned from this story and how we might apply that to new genetic targets as they emerge. Um, the work I'm going to present today has been primarily funded by an MRC project grant, um, and uh, uh, we're working currently in collaboration with um, J and J Innovations. Um, and this is also a plug for my uh, artistic collaborator Ellen Minnie, who's who I've been working with. Um, to kind of use art to communicate um, aspects of the science that I do. Um, her website is there, I highly recommend it. So I think one of the things that's been, from my point of view, transformative in the last 10 years is um, moving from the understanding that genes are important in psychiatric disorders to having something concrete um, to get our teeth into as, as, as neuroscientists. Um, so, as many of you will know, what's really changed in the last 10 years is that um, sequencing and studying genetic material has become much cheaper, which means that you can do studies in really, really large numbers of people and identify robust associations between specific genetic loci and um, psychiatric uh, diagnostic categories. So, what I'm going to talk about today really is how we understand um, what, what we know at the moment um, and I'm going to uh, emphasize there's a vast amount that we don't know at the molecular level, but I think that it's a real opportunity and I'll talk more about that in great detail. So the first thing I want to highlight is that um, what genetic studies in for the most part don't do is to identify specific genes. That's an important thing. They identify parts of the genome that confer risk for psychiatric disorders. So in many ways, the first challenge that we have as, as uh, molecular neuroscientists is to identify which of the genes are mediating these associations. I'm not going to go into detail about that today, but I'm really happy to chat to people either afterwards or in the breakout room about that challenge. Um, all of the psychiatric disorders have a significant um, genetic um, component to them. And really, in all cases, the, the genetics is um, a mixture of common variants that each individually um, confer a slight increase in risk for developing um, illness. And then there's also rare variants that have a much larger effect on risk, but are obviously rare because they, they tend to be presumably selected out of populations. So what I'd like to do today is to kind of walk you through how I think you can use this information to identify new targets and the steps that are going to be involved in that. And as I said, I'm going to illustrate that with um, some examples from our own research on cacna one c so the first important thing to note is that genes obviously don't encode psychiatric conditions, right? They don't encode hallucinations or um, low mood or any of the symptoms, the complex symptoms that patients experience. So really, I think the challenge for us in terms of understanding pathophysiology is understanding what genes are doing at multiple levels. Because I'm from a molecular background, I tend to start at the, the end of genetics and work upwards to the whole person. However, um, the, the example I'm going to use today, I think, is, a, is one where we've actually taken information both from genetics and from what we know about um, information from patients and existing medication with the aim of kind of hopefully meeting in the middle. So I suppose, broadly speaking, my approach is to understand the molecules that are encoded by um, individual genes, try and identify the genes that are mediating um, the associations with psychiatric disorders, and then try and figure out what those molecules are doing in cells, how that affects network function, how that affects um, cognitive processes within um, individuals, and then how that can give rise to the complex symptoms that we see in patients. And obviously this is quite a tall order, I'm well aware of that. What I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna focus really on the first step of this pathway, understanding what we do and in, uh, to a certain extent don't know about the molecules that are present in human brain. And, and how that provides both a challenge, but also an opportunity, I think, for drug development. So I'm going to be focusing on um, a gene that is a voltage-gated calcium channel. Um, so you can see a picture here of um, calcium signaling. Um, calcium is the most ubiquitous um, signaling molecule in our body. And so cells have whole suites of um, molecules that are designed to control where and when it is. So there's, broadly speaking, three mechanisms to do this. You can, can um, store calcium in, in within cells in, in things like the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, you can buffer calcium by binding to calcium binding proteins, or you can um, control the calcium coming in and out of cells. And the voltage-gated calcium channels that I'm gonna be focusing on today sit in the cell membrane here, and um, they allow calcium to enter the cell 
um, in response to electrical activity. So really the reason I became interested in, in this family of molecules was the genetics. So they've emerged as one of the most robust um, families of, of genes that are associated with um, a number of um, psychiatric disorders. And an important fact here is that the associations are fairly transdiagnostic. So um, the voltage gated calcium channels have been implicated in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, um, as well as across, across different disorders. And there's evidence both from rare and common um, genetic variations. So um, genetically speaking, these are really strong targets. And I'm going to focus particularly on catna one c today, and that was because um, it, it's probably of this family the one that showed the, the earliest and most robust association. So catna one c was the first gene to reach genome-wide significant association with bipolar disorder, for example. However, um, one of the things that's interesting about voltage-gated calcium channels is that this isn't, the genetic evidence isn't the only evidence out there. And this comes back, I think, to this idea that you can take information from, from um, things that have been observed in patients as well and translate that back. So if you look in the literature, there's a very long-standing um, literature um, where people have taken cells and, and serum from, from um, patients with bipolar disorder particularly, and they've noticed that calcium signaling is just a, a bit unusual either basal levels are different or um, influx of calcium in response to stimulation in blood cells, for example, is different in patients. And we recently um, systematically reviewed this evidence and we found that it's actually surprisingly robust. And what the mechanism is, we don't know at the moment, but again, it's another piece of evidence kind of implicating um, calcium signaling in, in um, psychiatric disorders. One of the things I think is really appealing about this family is we know quite a lot about them already. So this sort of taps into what John was talking about, um, the low hanging fruit. Um, it's much easier to understand the function of a molecule when you have some idea what it does. If you end up with some orphan receptor or um, um, a transcription factor, it can be really, really hard to know what, what is actually going on there. Um, however, as I'll come on to later, an important thing is that these channels aren't just important in the brain, they're important in uh, many electrically active tissues, and that would include the cardiovascular system. And that's something I think is important to bear in mind. And then the final thing that's appealing about these is we know that you can drug them. So calcium channel blockers are ubiquitous and widely used for cardiovascular indications. And so we know that broadly speaking, we can block these drugs um, and that doing so um, whilst it might have cardiovascular effects, is broadly speaking tolerable. However, there are a number of challenges associated with studying this family um, that actually, um, uh, I think, are, are true beyond these calcium channels. They provide a nice exemplar. The first thing is that if we look at common variants that are identified using genome-wide association studies, the risk polymorphism, so the, the individual variants, don't change the coding sequence of the channels. So we need to work out what it is that they're doing. Um, as a result, we think they're probably changing the way RNA is processed or expressed, where, when, that kind of thing. Um, but that's the first challenge I think we have to try and understand what is altered um, in the brains of patients with psychiatric conditions. The other thing that is, is a common theme, I think, in psychiatry genetics generally is that the calcium channel genes are very large and they're complex. So if you look at this figure here, this is a screen grab of what's currently annotated on the human genome as being produced from this gene, catna one c So what you're looking at here, each of these horizontal lines is a different isoform, different RNA transcript. And each of these vertical lines is an exon, um, and these are introns. And what happens is that RNA is spliced to remove the introns, um, and uh, the channel is encoded by these, these exons strung together in the line. Um, now we know that this is functionally important. It's not just random that you have lots of different types of um, CAT1C being produced from the gene. Um, rodent studies have shown really nicely that lots of different parameters of channel function are altered by um, alternative splicing, so production of different flavors of channel from the same gene. So things like channel properties, such as voltage of inactivation, um, as well as um, binding to the existing calcium channel blockers are all altered by RNA splicing. However, um, there's a big, big caveat here, which is that almost everything we know about um, calcium channels, um, we know based on rodent brain. Human channels have been very, very little studied. Brain almost, uh, human brain not, almost not at all. The other thing is we really don't know what the full length channels look like. That might sound kind of counterintuitive, but when you look at um, information on the genome like this, what you're actually looking at is um, 
transcripts that have been computationally reconstructed from short bits of sequencing that have been done across the gene. So we really don't know what, what at this end is stuck to what at the other end. Um, and so really that was a, a technical challenge um, and it was really technical limitations that, um, that caused this. So what we've been working to do is to understand in the first instance what the calcium channel that we're interested in, CATNA1C, actually look like in the human brain. Now to figure this out, we had to develop a new technical approach, um, but the first thing we needed was intact RNA from human brain. And so we're really fortunate to have a, a long-standing collaboration with Danny, uh, Joel and Tom from the Lieber Institute for brain, uh, for brain Development in the US. And they're able to provide us with um, really high quality um, post-mortem brain tissue. Um, this is really important because um, if, if uh, brain tissue isn't high quality, the RNA will fragment, which prevents you from looking at full length transcripts. We then use standard um, PCR, albeit long range PCR, to um, amplify up the full coding uh, sequence of CATNA1C, starting the first exon and ending in the last exon. And this was a technical tour de force by my postdocs, Aintani and Nicola. What's been really transformative, firstly, is um, the ability now to sequence long RNAs. Uh, actually, we convert them to DNA, but, but broadly speaking, we can now sequence full length calcium channels. And this is uh, the technology we've used is um, Oxford Nanopore technology. And this has been established in my lab by Mike Clark, who's now uh, leading his own group in Australia. Um, but this allowed us to, for the first time, you know, know what at one end is stuck to what at the other. So we can confidently say what isoforms are actually present. That's all very well and good, but we get millions of sequencing reads out of um, this information. And so we need to have a way of making sense of them. And so, um, as a result, I have a really productive collaboration with Wilfred Harty at the Earlham Institute, and he and his postdoc Tomash designed a really nice data analysis pipeline for us to make sense of all of this data that we're collecting. So I'm going to skip through the results of this experiment fairly quickly because it's published. Um, it was uh, published earlier this year. Um, but broadly speaking, what we found is essentially how much we don't know about human brain. The vast majority of transcripts being made from this gene in the human brain are novel. So in addition to the 40 that were annotated already, we actually found 200, over 250 isoforms of this calcium channel that are present in the human brain, and almost all of these were novel. In addition, it wasn't just that we were finding different combinations of the same exons, but we actually found in a gene with 50 exons, another 38 novel exons. So even in terms of the exons that are present, there's a lot to be learned in human tissue. Interestingly, it wasn't that the most abundant ones were the ones that were um, known about. Actually, we found that the majority of the novel, uh, uh, the majority of novel isoforms were abundant. Sorry, majority of abundant isoforms were novel. And in a paper, we show that um, the pattern of splicing of calcium channels differs between brain regions, which is kind of interesting because that suggests functional significance to this. So this is kind of a summary of what you've see if you look at all of the CATNA1C um, RNA in, in uh, the human brain. Essentially what we found is that, as I said, the majority of the pool, um, the majority of um, reads something for CATNA1C are novel, so over 50%. But I think even more interestingly, the vast majority of transcripts predict full length channels that should be functional. So that to me says this isn't just splicing noise, because if it, if it were, you would just see sort of 30% would be um, uh, would be predicted to be coding. So if we look at that on the protein model, um, what you can see again, I think speaks to the functional significance of this. So if you look at where splicing is happening, it's not affecting the transmembrane domains or any of the key um, functional domains for these channels. Um, so broadly speaking, the channels should be um, getting to the cell membrane and acting as calcium channels. What we see instead is changes in regions that are known to regulate the function of these channels. So um, coupling to second messenger signals is known to involve these um, intracellular regions. And interestingly, a lot of the variation um, is kind of concentrated around voltage sensing bits of the channel that determine the channel properties. So again, I think this speaks to the um, significance of this. So what you can see here, the numbers are the proportion of the total pool of CATNA1C that shows variation in these different regions, and this is novel variation. So again, you can see in some regions, it's really quite strikingly high. So why do we care about this? It all sounds rather terrifying. We've got way more calcium channels than we know what to do with. What on earth are we gonna do with that information? 
I think it's an opportunity rather than um, something to be terrified of. Um, I think that, that we have the potential to use this kind of molecular diversity to identify more selective targets of this calcium channel gene, CAT1 C gene. And I think that this um, principle will probably generalize elsewhere as well. So what we're interested in doing at the moment is characterizing um, the isoforms of the calcium channels that are present in the human brain versus the human cardiovascular system. Because if we can target brain isoforms and avoid cardiovascular isoforms, we would predict that that would be better um, from a drug development point of view with regards to psychiatry, obviously. So we started out by doing a proof of principle experiment in mice just to see whether there were indeed tissue differences in the isoforms of CATNA1C. This was work done by my PhD student, Saeed, seen here looking puzzled as to why there's a vegetable steam in the lab. I still haven't told him the answer to that question. Um, what we did was we took um, a small number of mice and dissected out um, frontal cortex, cerebellum, aorta and heart. And we compared the profile of calcium channels between these tissues. And what you can see really nicely in this principal component analysis plot is that the brain isoforms are just completely distinct from the cardiovascular isoforms, which are seen here and here. It's almost complete separation. Another interesting thing, again, is the majority of isoforms were novel and the majority were coding, which um, says even in mouse, which is really well studied, there's still a huge amount um, to be known and discovered. And interestingly, I think, um, from a translational point of view, we see that many of the human variants aren't seen in mouse. So again, I think that's it's to um, thinking about how we're going to develop um, better models as we go forward um, for translation. So what we've also been able to do is to mine existing human data to see if we can identify human isoforms which are enriched in the brain compared to the cardiovascular system. And what we've been doing is mining um, GTEx data. So this is a, a gene, uh, genotype tissue expression consortium. And what they've done is they've collected really high quality RNA-seq data from lots of different tissues of, of the human body. So we've um, selected um, data from 30 individuals where there was both brain and heart, and we compare the isoform profile between these regions. And what you're looking at here on this plot, everything that's shown in blue are regions that are differentially expressed between the brain and the cardiovascular system. And again, the thing to note is that many of these regions are regions that we know are involved in modulation. So intracellular signaling regions and also voltage sensing regions. So what we're working to do now is to understand the functional significance of this, to understand how um, brain isoforms differ from cardiovascular isoforms. And then obviously in the long run, the goal is to, to identify the best targets for, for psychiatric conditions. So I just want to finish by making some fairly general points. Um, I've shown you that the CATN1C gene doesn't encode one calcium channel, but encodes a family of calcium channels. And I think that's going to be true for many, many of the genes that we will be interested in in psychiatry. Certainly wherever we've looked, we have seen much more variation than is currently known. But I think that this represents um, an opportunity for us in drug development. We've shown quite nicely that the isoform profiles differ profoundly between brain regions and also between um, tissues of the human body. So I think this provides us with the opportunity to identify targets that might be more selective for psychiatric indications um, and, and even potentially um, selectively target brain regions um, if that were desirable. And so we were working on the hypothesis that brain enriched isoforms will represent novel therapeutic targets for psychiatric disorders. But I think I, what I'd really like to leave you with is um, just a sense of how much we don't know. We sequenced the human genome and we thought we'd understand everything and that's absolutely not the case. Um, but I think the potential for studying novel uh, molecules in human brain is, is a really exciting one, one that we should be invested in um, in psychiatry. And I think that um, this work really emphasizes the importance of access to, to human tissue, because as I um, emphasized, we, we have to be very cautious when extrapolating from rodents to humans. So that's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to thank, uh, finish by thanking, thanking my many, many collaborators and to echo Laura's comments at the beginning that this was a picture from our lab, joint lab retreat last year and um, two things strike me firstly i wish we were on a joint lab retreat this year and secondly we're incredibly close together which in <laughs> in the current time seems quite odd but hopefully this will we will be able to return to this way of life at some point um, and i'm really happy to take any questions or to talk to people in the breakout room afterwards <laughs>